Thank you all for being here, and I am incredibly grateful that I get to share my story with you tonight. I'm what they call a PK, a pastor's kid. <laughs> my mother's a minister, my grandfather was a minister, and my great-great-grandfather was a minister. I can't remember the first time I went to church. It was just a part of my childhood for as long as I can remember. Every Sunday, the whole family would pack into the car, and off we'd go to this big brownstone church in Back Bay, Boston, with tall stained glass windows. My, my first memories of church are in that building. Vague sense impressions of golden light and dusty red pew cushions and lots of organ music. I loved growing up in church. I loved the community, the stories, the rituals, quiet joy of singing Silent Night by Candlelight on Christmas Eve, and the exquisite tragedy of a Maundy Thursday tenebrae service as the church is shrouded in black, the lights are extinguished, and the congregation departs in silence. These rituals shaped my experience of the divine. But as I got older, I struggled. I struggled with questions of belief and doctrine. I took issue with original sin. The crucifixion made no sense to me. And I didn't believe that Christianity was the only path to God. And what about the Bible's stance towards homosexuality or women? I was turned off by language that depicts God as a male ruler. And I struggled to fit my beliefs into the framework of Christianity convinced that I needed to believe certain things in order to be Christian. I wondered if there was space in Christianity for my experience of the divine. My dad had introduced me to yoga in sixth grade, and as I got more and more uncomfortable with my Christian identity, yoga became more and more important. It felt so simple compared to Christianity. It, it was about being present, about breathing deeply and living fully. It was about loving and accepting myself exactly as I was, no worrying about belief or doctrine. It connected me to a spirituality that felt good, that felt easy. And by the end of high school, I knew I wanted to get certified as a yoga instructor. And so at the end of my sophomore year of college, I found myself enrolled in the teacher training program at Kripalu School of Yoga in Ayurveda, a beautiful brick building with lots of windows nestled in the Berkshire's rolling hills overlooking woods and a lake. But by this time, my relationship to Christianity had shifted dramatically. During my first two years at Williams, I spent a lot of time in the chaplain's office, arguing with myself and with my tradition. I thought that if I didn't believe in a patriarchal God or the unique saving power of Jesus or original sin, I couldn't be Christian. Most days I wanted to leave Christianity behind. I wanted to have my own spiritual experience without forcing it into a doctrinal box. But at the same time, I felt that Christianity wouldn't let me go. The stories, the traditions, they were a part of me. I couldn't imagine a life without Christmas, or Holy Week, or singing hymns. It just didn't feel possible. Christianity refused to let me go. One day, talking with a friend, I, I shared this anxiety of mine that I couldn't be Christian if I didn't believe certain things. He said, and I'll never forget it, that's bullshit. <laughs> Put that in the rearview mirror. <laughs> that moment changed my life. I started to see Christianity not as a list of beliefs, but as a practice, as a community, as a place to stand. To be Christian, I realized, is not to hold all the same beliefs as every other Christian, but rather to engage in a conversation, to join in a struggle to make meaning as a community, a community built around common stories, symbols, and rituals. As I came to understand this, I slowly began to reclaim my Christian identity, or rather, to take ownership 
of the identity that never left me, even when I wanted nothing to do with it. So that summer, I left for Kripalu, still adjusting towards a new stance towards Christianity, and unsure of how yoga now fit into the picture. Only 45 minutes south of Williamstown, I entered a world of flowing clothing, 6 a.m. yoga sessions, and breakfast eaten in contemplative silence. My time there was, in many ways, idyllic. My fellow teachers in training were kind, daily practice was invigorating, the instructors seemed knowledgeable and wise, and the picturesque surroundings made awe a daily occurrence. In the training, we talked a lot about compassion. Kripalu means to be compassionate in Sanskrit, and we worked to cultivate compassion towards ourselves and others. An important part of this process was encouraging self-care. In order to be effectively compassionate, we were told that we needed to take time to breathe, relax, and do the things that fed us. The culture of compassion and self-care created a sense of peace and calm, an emotional state to match the peace and calm of the scenery. And then the unthinkable happened. On the evening of June 17th, during the third week of our program, a white gunman entered a historically black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and shot and killed nine people at a midweek Bible study. The shooter, only 21 years old, spent almost an hour sitting with them before opening fire. At Kripalu, the news trickled in slowly. Unplugged as I was, unplugged as we all were, I didn't hear about the massacre until later the next day. I got a chance to talk to a few other people about it at lunch, and it was clear that by that time, most of us knew what had happened. During the afternoon session, we gathered as usual, and I thought, surely, surely our instructors will mention what we are all thinking about. They will name the tragedy that is on all of our hearts and minds. But they did not. Class continued as if nothing unusual had happened that day, except for a brief, insultingly vague addition to the closing meditation, that we should send positive energy to people who are suffering. As a group, as a community, we were allowed to leave class, to go to dinner, and watch the sunset without acknowledging the tragedy. We returned to our lives with nothing to disturb the peace and the calm. The word compassion comes from two Latin words, and it literally means to suffer with. Suffering with can take many forms. It might look like sitting and crying with a friend who has just gone through a breakup, or it might mean spending your Sunday working at a soup kitchen instead of hanging out with friends. But it means looking beyond ourselves, recognizing and to some extent sharing the pain of others. How, I wondered that night, how had we, a community supposedly dedicated to compassion, failed to recognize, even for a moment, the monumental suffering of our fellow human beings, neglecting even to name their and our loss, we chose to stay in the warm, fuzzy glow of self-care. Later that night, a small group of us decided to gather outside in the falling darkness and keep vigil around a single candle. Someone read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. As I sat in that circle, watching the candle that seemed if it was continuously about to be extinguished by the wind, I thought about compassion. 
about suffering with. It struck me in that moment that compassion might look a lot messier than we want it to, that it might be more than the warm, fuzzy feeling of being nice and taking care of yourself. It struck me that compassion might look like getting tear gassed by police in Ferguson while protesting the death of Michael Brown. The compassion might look like getting assassinated on the balcony of a hotel room in Memphis, Tennessee for fighting racial injustice. That compassion might look like dying on a cross, fighting for the rights of the poor and oppressed in an occupied nation. For the first time in my life, I saw the crucifixion for what it was, an image of someone suffering, God suffering with us. The cross I saw is about compassion. Before that night, the crucifixion hadn't meant much to me. I saw Jesus mainly as a wisdom teacher, a philosopher who had some good ideas about being nice to one another. And his death never made sense to me. But that night, I saw Jesus' death on the cross as I never had before, as an example of what it really means to be compassionate to suffer and die for and with the suffering and dying. An image of true, embodied, messy compassion that is intensely relevant to the suffering and pain of our world. I think self-care is deeply important. If we do not take the time to know and love ourselves, we will not be of much use to anyone. Self-care matters. But the conversation cannot end there. If we wish to live lives of compassion, whether from a desire to serve God or simply because we believe it is the right thing to do, we must be willing to suffer. Like Jesus of Nazareth and Dr. King and the thousands of people working for justice around the globe, we must be willing to face the very real pain and darkness of this world. Such a life of compassion need not begin with grand political movements and calls for sweeping change, even if that is one place it could lead. Such compassion need only begin with the simple, and life-changing choice to face the suffering of our fellow human beings and to not turn away. We must let our hearts be broken. For if we let our hearts be broken, then surely our feet and hands cannot be still, nor our actions idle. The day after the vigil, a few of us made signs with the names and ages of all the victims of the South Carolina shooting and put them in the classroom where they'd be seen, believing that it was important to name what had happened. That night, sitting around the candle, trying to make sense of the pain and violence and suffering in the world, I came to a new appreciation of my Christian identity. Being Christian for me means recognizing the pain and suffering of my fellow human beings and making the radical choice to not turn away. It means letting my heart be broken. It means daring to live a life of compassion. Thank you. <laughs>